This session, we are going to be learning skills training. There are three components that need to be covered in the skills training. These components are explanations, examples, and experiences. These components are to be used in individual and group sessions as appropriate. Explanations are, God's word is the only solution for a positive outcome by explaining spirit versus flesh that foster help, hope, and healing to the client. Spirit is pneuma in the Greek. Flesh is sarx in the Greek. The Christian counselor provides godly solutions rather than man-made solutions. Note. Spirit and flesh will be explained in detail in the lesson on the spirit, soul, body complex. Examples. Using the model of life will help the client by pinpointing men and or women of the Bible that are either acted in the spirit, positive consequences, or reacted in the flesh, negative consequences, that clearly gives the client a picture of behavior and its consequences. What better example to use than the Bible? Men and women that have already experienced what probably every person that comes in front of us as counselees have already experienced. The counselor uses the model of life with biblical and personal examples to discover distorted thinking in the client. Every person that comes in front of us for counseling has some form of distorted thinking. It is our job to recognize what that distorted thinking is and be able to guide each individual through the Word of God to hope, help, hope, and healing. Experience is leading people through God's Word with biblical examples and explanations that foster help, hope, and healing to the client. Note, the experience makes it real for the client. There are many different types of counseling skills. There's the here and now. There is let's explore childhood and see what root is keeping you from being able to move forward. But in this session, we're going to teach you eight basic counseling skills where you will have an opportunity to use this in your everyday life. To become an effective counselor, one must have some understanding and proficiency in a combination of the following components that are involved in the personality of the client. These components are three, cognitive, affective, and behavioral aspects of a person's personality. They're not a cookie cut. Not every person that comes to us for counseling is going to react the same way. We're going to see a, a wide range of behaviors. And so we need to have enough information at our fingertips to be able to help our counselees. This is the reason why the model of life is an important counseling tool. Personality co components. Think about their beliefs and their assumptions. That's cognitive. Experience on a feeling level their conflicts and struggles. That's affective. Translate their insights into actions. That's behavioral. Application of the Word of God is always the key for positive biblical change. So some of you will be asking, well, will I always use scripture? Will I always open up in a prayer? Will I always close in a prayer? What if they really are struggling with their relationship with Christ? or they're not a believer at all, then you will have to lead them through salvation for you to even be able to do Christian counseling with them. So the application of the Word of God is always the key for positive, positive biblical change. Questions to ponder. Does the client believe any lies? Is the client making decisions based only on feelings? Is a client making most of his or her choices based on a biblical worldview? After being enlightened by the Holy Spirit, is a client willing to submit to the will of God? Christian Framework The model of life addresses all three of these important factors from a biblical framework, cognitive, affective, and behavioral. The philosophy Using the model of life is useful also in group or in private counseling. 
Christian counselors must always think from a biblical framework. Opinions are not used. God understands our need to think biblically. As it says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So when we start counseling and we start putting into place these skills, you've got to remember that it's a heart issue. We're dealing with people's heart. And then Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. So remember what you're sharing with counselees is a course for their life. So you want to be sure to use a biblical framework. The cognitive, how we think, affective, how we feel, and behavioral, how we act or perhaps react, dimensions of a person's life are all addressed in the Bible. Important. The model of life incorporates each of these aspects of the man's personality in order to promote biblical change. The model of life, another tool setting the captives free, and using the eight counseling skills are the primary tools used in private and or group counseling. The model of life with the leadership of the Holy Spirit and setting the captives free are one of the most powerful tools to bring about healthy resolution, thereby making real biblical change in a client's life. Understand and apply in the following, God consciousness, world consciousness, and self-consciousness in the counseling relationship for spirit, soul, body understanding are important aspects of the healing process. God consciousness is the ability of the born again person whose human spirit has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God to be aware of God. The regenerated human spirit is the way to communicate with God. Those who worship God worship him in spirit and truth as it is written in John 4 24. I'm going to read it again. Those who worship God worship him in spirit and in truth. World consciousness is the way man connects to the elements of the world. Emotions and feelings are fundamental layers of his consciousness. A person experiences its influence and their relationship to these experiences through people, place, things, and themselves. Note, nothing really happens in our consciousness without the participation of feelings with degrees of sub subtlety color and fullness. Self-consciousness is where it focuses its energies inward on self. Whether the person has an outward focused personality or an inward focused personality. Shyness. Either way, it's all about me. Important. Most counselors miss this concerning shy people. Shy people are very self-centered. Jesus Christ is the wonderful counselor. The Christian counselor using the model of life, setting the captives free, and applying the eight counseling skills will provide possibly the best Christian counseling available anywhere. The Christian counselors will always point the client to Jesus Christ, who is the wonderful counselor. Jesus is always our sure foundation. Praise God. Letting go. To let go doesn't mean to stop caring. It means I can't do it for someone else. To let go is not to cut myself off. It's the realization that I can't control another. To let go is not enable, but to allow learning from natural consequences. To let go is to admit powerlessness, which means the outcome is not in my hands. To let go is not to try to change or blame another. I can only change myself. To let go is not to fix, but to be supportive. To let go is not to judge, but to allow another to be a human being. To let go is not to be in the middle arranging all of the outcomes, but to allow others to affect their own outcomes. To let go is not to be protective. It is to permit another to face reality. To let go is not to deny, but to accept. To let go is not to nag, scold, or argue, but to search out my own shortcomings and correct them. 
to let go is not to just adjust everything to my desires, but to take each day as it comes. To let go is not to criticize or regulate anyone, but to try to become what I dreamed I could be. To let go is not to regret for the past, but to grow and live for the future. And to let go is to fear less and live more. Let's talk about the eight basic counseling skills. To be an effective faith-based Christian counselor, the counselor must obtain some basic counseling skills such as attending, paraphrasing, reflection of feelings, summarizing, probing, counselor's self-disclosure, interpreting, and confrontation. I'm going to encourage you that after you have completed this session, that you go on YouTube and put in basic counseling skills and look at all the different types that are out there. What I want to encourage you to do is to reflect back on these eight basic counseling skills and try to incorporate them in your everyday life and really understand that as simple as they are, really work. It, it requires you to listen, to have good eye contact, to not cut somebody off when they're talking, being able to reflect back to them emotions that they showed or no emotions. There's a lot of things you can use with these eight basic counseling skills and you really will find out that you don't have to make it difficult to help someone. Attending. The counselor has concern and interest in the client by using proper eye contact good body posture, and accurate verbal tracking. The components of attending are listening and observing. Communicating to the client that listening and observing is taking place in the counseling session. This might be a simple nod of the head, not too much nodding. This might be just really good eye contact with the person. Attending. Let's talk about some of the purposes to attend. Number one, it encourages the counselee to continue expressing their ideas and feelings freely. It helps the client relax and be comfortable in the counseling session. It gives the client a sense of responsibility for what is happening in the counseling session. Listening, not enough. Effective listening by itself is not enough. Counseling occurs in a face-to-face -face situation where both counselor and client watch as well as listen to each other. The communication is accomplished through nonverbal means such as body posture, facial expressions, eye contact, and gestures. If you spend most of the counseling session during the attending scrunching or acting shocked, understand that that's going to prompt the counselee maybe to shut down and not to share anything else with you. Try to have a very relaxed posture with them and really intently listen to them. The next one is paraphrasing. The counselor repeats back to the client in exact or similar words that now bring clarity to what is said. Yes, it sounds like we're mimicking back, but it also shares with the counselee that we were listening intently that we can repeat verbatim what they said back. By using paraphrasing, it confirms to both the counselor and client what is being stated is accurate and understood by both parties. Paraphrasing focuses mainly on cognitive verbal content such as people, places, and things, the events. Primarily, the counselor uses similar words as the client, but fewer in number. It communicates to the client that the counselor understands or is trying to understand what is being said. It sharpens the client's meaning of words by having his or her words rephrased more concisely by the counselor. It encourages the client to expand his, on his or her discussion of the same subject. It also clarifies confusing content for both the counselor and the client. It lets both counselor and client know if accurate verbal following is taking place. It also is a time to see if you and the counselee are able to communicate with each other. 
it verifies to the counselor that his or her perception of the verbal contact is correct. It spotlights an issue by stating it more accurately. It can offer a new direction for the client to follow for subsequent remarks. The counselor is to help the client to identify and express his or her feelings about people, places, and things easily seen in the model of life. We must communicate with the client not only the factual or cognitive level, meaning people, places, and things, but we must also emphasize the affective level, which constitutes our feelings concerning people, places, and things. Remember I said earlier, does the client believe a lie? Dealing with feelings and emotions, whether it is our own feeling or someone else, is one of the most difficult parts of human relations. One difficulty is the majority of Americans, because of our culture, does not value open and free expression of feelings or emotions. At an early age, we learn to control, mask, or even deny our feelings. We have all heard this statement, boys don't cry. I'm working with someone right now, a mother, whose spouse does not allow the boys to cry. The good news is, is that I referred them to Depelchin. So the boys are getting great counseling. And they're learning through play therapy that it is okay to cry. And then in the family sessions, that therapist will address those issues. Let's continue to talk about reflection of feelings, the third basic counseling skill. Because the primary emphasis is in our school system is on intellectual achievement, we are from a very early age conditioned to restrain and even deny our emotions. Think about a teacher who has 28 five-year-olds in a room. Johnny, don't be crying right now. We don't have time for that. There's nothing to cry about. Y'all quit crying. You shouldn't be upset. 28 five-year-olds in one classroom. That's a lot of emotions. So you already have somebody telling them, don't have any feelings, let's just keep moving forward. So we have to address and, and let people know it's okay to have feelings. It's what's attached to those feelings, behavioral, that we might have to address. You know, the Word of God says, it's okay to be angry, but don't sin. It conveys to the client that the counselor understand or is trying to understand the feelings being expressed. It clarifies the client's feelings and attitudes by mirroring them in a non-judgmental way. I cannot stress how important it is that when we have a counselee sitting on the other side of us, there is no judgment. Our opinion better not be inside of this counseling session. We need to have a non-judgmental posture. And we need to let them know that, that they can tell us anything. And we're going to help them through that. We're going to encourage them through the Word of God. We're going to use examples. And we're going to let them share the experiences. Let's talk about purpose of reflection of feelings. It gives the client the opportunity to recognize and accept his or her feelings as part of himself or herself. It verifies the counselor's perceptions of what the client is feeling. It can bring out a problem areas without the client feeling pushed. Some of the nonverbal cues are distinct messages of emotional content will also come from nonverbal cues. Nonverbal indicators of feeling include such things as head and facial movements, posture, gestures. I work with a counselor who her one of her favorite terms is posturing, that she can tell when a client is really struggling with uh, expressing themselves or getting honest. They'll posture themselves. They'll make these gestures like, oh, I'm fine. Everything's good. And, and every so often, they start posturing again. And it's a clue that they're really uncomfortable. And they might not be totally open in sharing what's really going on with them. So there's some other, other ways to tell. Nonverbal indicators, posturing. So when you see people do this while they're talking to you, they're probably uncomfortable. Voice tone and quality. 
You might have somebody who's very angry and they're talking in a very low tone. It's okay to address that. Is that how you talk when you're angry? And you know what? It might be. Some nonverbal observations are lowered head, folded arms, restlessness, crying, slowness of speech. They kind of ho-hum around. I want to go back. It is not up to us counselors to fill in the blanks. We want the counselees, even though they're struggling, they must fill in the blank with their own words. Remember, we're great fishing guides. So we need to show them how to, to get the healing that they've come to receive. It's not for us to give them all the answers. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit, right? Let's talk about summarizing. The counselor will review the main points that were discussed in the counseling session. This usually takes place close to the end of the session. You say, well, let's summarize what we talked about today. This summarizing will focus on both feelings and content and should be made brief and to the point. Back to the client. No new information or discussion should be added at the end. It's not uncommon for counselees to want the session to continue. So they might throw in a curveball to you. And you might have to say, you know what? Wow, that really was really good that you brought that up. I'm going to make a note of that so that we can talk about that the next time you're here. And it's still a good way to kind of wrap up the session. This time is used to pull all the pieces together. It is the time to make a picture out of the counseling session. Let's talk about some of the purposes of summarizing to ensure continuity and focus in the counseling session, to clarify a client's scattered thoughts and feelings by the counselor by pulling everything together for closure of that particular counseling session. It can close discussions on a given topic. It can clear the way for a new topic to be discussed later. It can provide a sense of movement and progress to the client. That is so important that they see that they've made some progress. It can draw several of the thoughts and feelings into a common theme that can bring closure. Let's talk about probing. The counselor can use questions and direct statements that help the client to look at situations that need further exploration. Always remember the root problem must be identified if true biblical closure is to be accomplished. A probing question sometimes called an open-ended question. In the secular world we call it motivational interviewing and again you can google motivational interviewing and it gives you great examples of how to ask open-ended questions. It requires more than a one-word answer from the client. So John, tell me about when you said, I really need for you to listen to me, what was the response from your family? So he has to tell me the response and then that gives me some insight into how the, the family is responding to him. Consider the following statements. Did you have a good relationship with your parents? Tell me about your relationship with your parents. So out of the two, which one would you choose? If I asked you, did you have a good relationship with your parents, and you said, oh, it was okay, that is not what I wanted. Tell me about your relationship with your parents. And you might look at the age that they're at and choose maybe some years younger to see if there's some differences. Watch your language. How you say it makes a difference. The subject is identical, but likely the answers are very different. Number one is a closed-ended question. The expected reply is yes or no. If the counselor asks that question and gets a one-word answer, then the counselor has to come up with another question to encourage a greater response. 
Note, a client may choose to say more, but often they do not. Number two already encourages the client to explore the issue. A counselor gets more information this way. And the session seems less like an integration. There is another important difference between these two sentences. Number one is a leading question. It suggests that the client had a good relationship with his or her parents. This is not a particularly troubling example of leading question. Consider a question like, did your parents abuse you? This not is not merely a closing to question, but a question which introduces an unsettling ideal to the client's consciousness. Counselors generally avoid that issue unless there is a reason to explore it with the client. Practical application. The same principles can be applied by anyone trying to get a conversation going. Remember I said that earlier, that you can use all of these basic counseling skills in your everyday life. If you are talking with someone who you don't know very well, ask them an open-ended question. See if you can change yes or no questions into open-ended versions. Asking more open-ended questions gives the other person the opportunity to talk for a while, letting you get to know each other better. You might ask your counselee, what is something you really enjoy doing? A hobby. One of my counselees, what I learned about him was, is that he really enjoys rescuing dogs. And it has become a full-time hobby for him. He got a local veterinarian involved in it, who doesn't charge him, but when he's able to, I guess, adopt the patient, uh, the, adopt the animal out, he is able to pay the vet. It, it's amazing what you learn by just asking open-ended questions. Note, the next time you meet a stranger at the church or office, practice this skill. Probing. Let's continue. The counselor uses their judgment to identify an issue touched on by the client that needs further exploration. The counselor uses probing only after other skills have been used with the client. Note, you must earn the right to probe. After earning the right to probe, by listening, observing, and now probing other issues may be discovered, underlying discoveries that seem to be unresolved. or problems that seem to need further exploration and development. Some of the questions that you can ask. Tell me more about your drinking only on weekends. When phrased as a statement, the probe contains a strong element of direction by the counselor. Example, you would say, tell me more about your relationship with your parents. Tell me how you felt when the boss made negative statements towards you in the sales meeting. Could you expand on that a little bit more? It helps the counselor better understand what the client is describing by giving him or her more information and direction. It helps encourage the client to clarify, elaborate, or illustrate what he or she has been saying. It helps to keep the counseling session on track. It helps focus the client's attention on a feeling or content area. It helps enhance the client's awareness and understanding or his or her situation or feelings. It helps direct the client's attention to areas the counselor thinks needs attention. Let's talk about self-disclosure. The counselor shares with the client his own feelings, attitude, experiences for benefit of client. When I'm training counselors, I tell them it's okay to cry with your clients but not harder. You also don't have to self-disclose a particular experience that you've had so that, the patient, so that the counselee feels more at ease. Be careful when you think about self-disclosure. It's not to put you on the same playing field as the counselee. They already know what that feels like. They want to know how to feel better. Any type of disclosure should relate directly to the person's situation now. By revealing person personal information, the counselor can de develop a deeper level of mutual trust, empathy, genuineness that can bring about help, hope, and healing. 
purposes of self-disclosure. It builds a sense of trust and rapport between the counselor and the client. It reduces the client's feelings that he or she is unique and alone in the situation. It fosters a feeling of empathy in the counseling relationship. It enables the counseling relationship to move to deeper levels. It promotes the expression of feelings by the client in the counseling relationship. It creates an atmosphere where the client feels free to express content or feelings that he or she had previously avoided. Some of the guidelines for self-disclosure are the counselor's self-disclosure should relate directly to the client's situation. First, the counselor must use attending, paraphrasing, reflection of feelings, summarizing, and even some of the probing to ensure an understanding of the client's situation before self-disclosure is used. The counselor is to relate disclosure directly to the client's situation. The counselor should disclose only experiences that have actually happened to him or her using pronouns such as I, me, my, or myself. Note, this can give a clear message to the client that the experience is real. Also, the counselor has the option of revealing information about themselves on various levels of intimacy. Now let's talk about interpreting. The first step in interpreting is, the, is to determine the basic message the client has expressed and restate it by saying something like, the way I see it, or I wonder if. These are appropriate ways to begin an interpretation. The counselor will help the client to look at alternative solutions to the issue. Interpreting involves additional ideas from the counselor to provide a new frame of reference to see other possible solutions. Important. One way to make this effective is to add a simple phrase like this. Am I understanding you correctly? Does this sound correct? At the end of a new point in the conversation. Components of interpreting. Determining and restating the basic message Adding counselor ideas for a new frame of reference. Checking out new ideas, possible solutions with the client. Having mutual responsibility for a positive biblical solution to the problem. The guidelines for interpreting are, interpreting is more complex and subtle skill than other skills under consideration. The following guideline will be helpful in interpreting. The counselor should use simple language close to the level at which the client is operating. Don't use language theological the client would most likely not understand. Some counselors will say that they use like a sixth grade language. You will have some counselees who are very intelligent. So you're going to want to meet them on their own intellectual level. The counselor encourages the client to get in the habit of considering alternative ways to view the situation. An example is, the counselee might say that feelings of loneliness have caused him to drink in the past. The counselor might respond by saying, let's look at some things you might do to deal with the feelings of loneliness. Do some brainstorming with the client. Brainstorm some ideas with the client here. Make a list of some possible activities the client could do to avoid loneliness. Open discussion. Make a list in class of activities this type of client could use to avoid loneliness. Now let's talk about the last skill, confrontation. The counselor will use a deliberate question or statement in order to get to the root issue. This is used when the counselor senses that the client is avoiding a particular situation and or person. Mutual trust and empathy must already firmly be established before the counselor can use confrontation. This is such an important issue because if you have not established mutual trust and empathy, it's, the counselee is more likely to become very guarded, restricted, and not open at all, it might not even return for the next session. 
So the purpose of confrontation is this. It is to help the client become more congruent. That is, what the client says corresponds with how he or she behaves. It is to help the client focus on changes in the way they think in order to embrace biblical principles that will change his or her behavior. It establishes the counselor as a role model in using direct, honest, and open communication. It often breaks down the defenses of the client, which he or she has consciously or unconsciously put up. It tends to bring about empathy in the counseling relationship when the client perceives the counselor has his or her best interest at heart. It can encourage the client to acknowledge his or her feelings and behavior by bringing to the surface things that have been denied up to this point. Some helpful guidelines in confronting are guidelines that the counselor should keep in mind when confronting. Mutual trust and empathy must already be firmly established as part of the counseling relationship. It must be done in a positive and constructive way, not as a negative or punitive act by a judgmental counselor. Example, never speak in general terms such as you're always talking about changing your behavior, so why don't you do it? It is better to say, you say you want to quit drinking, or whatever the situation is, but what I see you doing is figuring out, figuring out how to get a pint to get through the day, or it appears you are continuing to receive benefits from drinking. No matter if the consequences are negative for somebody drinking or using drugs, there's still a benefit from it. They're still getting something from it. And you need to explore that with them. I hope that you've been able to really see the benefits of the eight basic counseling skills. I'm gonna encourage you to use them when you're talking with family, the next time you're at a grocery store, the next time you're at church, any place, your workplace, your coworkers, just put into practice these skills and see the, see the responses that you get from, from others. You will be taking your test and you'll be able to go online and you will be able to click test.